Content warning. The Matherson marriage contains unhealthy relationship dynamics and fictional domestic abuse. If you are in a real-life Matherson marriage, please reach out to the appropriate authorities for help. Resources you may find helpful include the Pixel Project's Domestic Violence Resource page and UN Women's International Helplines list. Resources will be linked in the video description for accessibility. Hi, I'm Morgan, and today I will be reading from The Matherson Marriage by Ruby M. Ayers. Chapter 18 Joy says tomorrow never comes, Dodie. Pansy woke from a restless sleep the following morning with Buster's innocent words ringing in her ears. She lay still with closed eyes, wishing she could die. Surely last night she must have experienced every emotion in the world, but the one that remained, scorching her like flame, was humiliation. She had no longer any faith in Lynn Ramston. The only explanation of his conduct that would come to her wary brain was that he had repented and wished to see her no more. She had walked the miles to Chiswell's only to learn from the voluble Mrs. Gee that he had gone out almost directly after receiving her letter and had not since returned. To avoid her, she guessed it instinctively, and yet she had waited all those hours in the vain hope that there might be some explanation, and there was none. Joyce came in before she was dressed. Let me bring bre breakfast up to you. I know you haven't slept well, she pleaded. I heard you walking about your room ever so late last night. Pansy looked at her. Joyce, you did take my note to Chiswell's, she asked. On your word of honor, did you? Joyce flushed. On my word of honor, Pansy. Pansy lay back on her pil pillows. Of course. I beg your pardon. And then, after a moment, who did you give it to, Joyce? Joyce answered in a choked voice. To Mr. Ramsden himself. He was in the hall. I gave it into his own hands. She dared not look at Pansy, and it seemed a long time before the silence was broken. Then Pansy said, in a quiet voice, I think I'll get up, Joyce. I shall feel better if I get up. She dressed and went downstairs to find her husband waiting breakfast. He looked up to make some irritable remark and then stopped. Are you well? he asked with a touch of uneasiness. My headaches, that's all. You stay in the house too much. Why don't you go out more? I'll go out with you this morning if you like. He looked taken aback. Oh, all right, he answered awkwardly. Do you mind if I take Buster? Pansy asked. No. Matherson kept looking at her from time to time uneasily. After breakfast, he followed her to her room. He shut the door and coughed nervously. <coughs> uh, Pansy? Well? She was putting on her hat and did not turn. Matherson went behind her and put his arm round her waist. You don't quite hate me, do you? Her whole body stiffened as if in protest against his embrace, but she managed to answer. You know I don't. He kissed her. That business worry I told you about is all over now. And things are all right. If I've been a bear, I hope you'll forget it. I dare say I was to blame too, Basil. He looked re he looked relieved. Well, it's all right now, anyway, eh? He said, yes. He went away quite contentedly, and Pansy stood with her hands hanging limply at her sides, her eyes stony with despair. All right, when nothing would be all right for her ever again. But if she had made up her mind to thrust Lynn Ramsden from her thoughts and speak of him no more, Violet had done no such thing. She gave Matherson no peace. It's a shame not to ask him here like you used to, she declared, just because he's lost his money. You might lose yours some day, Basil, and then how would you feel if everyone turned from you? I've never told Ramston to stay away, Matherson objected sulkily. If he wanted to come, I suppose he would. And I suppose he wouldn't if he thought he wasn't wanted, Violet answered flatly. Pansy, why don't you ask him? Pansy raised her eyes. I've no objection to Mr. Ramston coming, she said quietly. She looked at her husband. Shall we ask him to dinner one night, Basil? It was ten days now since she had seen Lynn, and her heart seemed to have turned to stone. She felt that she cared for nothing. Even Buster seemed to have drifted away from her in some incomprehensible manner. She made the suggestion of asking Lynn to dinner with absolute indifference. She had been wounded to the death. Nothing else could hurt her. Matherson colored, and his eyes fell. He had tried lately to be kinder to his wife. In his heart, he was ashamed of his suspicions. His natural conceit had told him he was wrong. Why should she desire to look at another man when he had given her everything the most exacting woman could wish for? He had certainly been better tempted. He had certainly been better tempered. Lynn Ramston's money had banished the dread of ruin, and he had begun cheerfully speculating again. 
Ask the fellow to dinner if you like. He said he can refuse if he doesn't care to come. I hear he's leaving in a week anyway. Is Chiswell's bot? Violet asked quickly. I believe so. I heard something about it. He was lucky to get such a quick sale. Well, who will ask him to dinner, you or I? Violet demanded of her sister later. There seems to be a blight over this house, she declared petulantly. There's no life in any of you. Pansy, is anything the matter, old girl? Pansy moved restlessly. What could be the matter? She asked. You always say I've got everything I want and that I'm to be frightfully envied. There was a little silence. Well, who'll ask Lynn to dinner? Violet insisted once more. Pansy laughed. <laughs> I, I shall. I, I shall not. That's quite certain. Basil's the one who has dropped him, so he is the one to ask him to overlook it and come to the house again. Violet considered. But did he drop him, as you call it? She asked in a puzzled voice. Basil swears that they didn't quarrel, and yet all at once Lynn stops coming here. Perhaps he doesn't want to come any more. Perhaps he doesn't, Pansy agreed. I think when people are as friendly as, as he and Basil were, it often comes to a sudden end. Violet shrugged her shoulders. I never could understand what they saw in each other, she said bluntly. There's different, it's chalk and cheese. There was a little silence. Then Pansy asked, haven't you seen Lynn at all since I came home? Only that day I went over, when he was so strange. I don't mind admitting that I've been everywhere where I thought I might meet him, but I never have. You know, Pansy, I can't rid myself of the feeling that there's something behind it all. Something, I don't know what. What could there be? I don't know, but I feel in my bones that there is something. That's probably because you want to feel it, Pansy said. I've had that feeling myself often, about different things, but it's never been right. No, I think we must make up our minds that Lynn has had enough of us and wants to drop a friendship he's got tired of. Could it be she who was saying these things with such self-possession when only last night she had lain awake for hours in torment? I don't believe it, Violet said stoutly. I know Lynn, and I don't believe it. At any rate, I shall keep Basil up to asking him to dinner. He won't come. Pansy said. Violet looked at her curiously. I don't believe you want him, she declared. Pansy turned away without answering. There were moments when the iciness of her heart seemed to melt and leave a searing flame in its place, moments when she felt she must die of her sheer longing to see Lynn or of her despair. She wandered out into the garden, and Buster came running after her. Dolly, take Buster, see Lynn and Tom Tinker? Pansy looked at him, her color fading. It was some time now since Buster had spoken of Lynn, and she answered hurriedly. Not today, darling. Some other time, perhaps. Buster stamped his foot. Now, he insisted. Pansy knelt down on the grass and put her arms around him. Lynn doesn't want us any more. He's going away. Buster regarded her with solemn eyes. Going away? He said, incre he repeated incredulously. Yes. Pansy had not shed a tear for days, but now they came rushing to her eyes, and she hid her face against Buster's little shoulder. He fidgeted uncomfortably. Don't cry, Dolly. Make me all wet, he objected. She tried to laugh. She dried her eyes. Sorry, darling. Kiss me, Buster. You do love me, don't you? Yes, he kissed her rapturously. Love you, and he said, I love Lynn and Joyce and Auntie Violet and Tom Tinker. He turned away from her and went back to his play, but there was a troubled thought in his mind. Why didn't Lynn want him any more? He found it difficult to believe that there was anybody in the world so misguided as not to want him. He left the spotted horse in the green cart he had been pulling by a string round the paths and wandered down to the gate. Buster had a will of his own, and when he wanted a thing, it was seldom that he forgot that he wanted it, and the thought of Lynn and Tom Tinker tugged hard at his heart. He stood for some time looking thoughtfully, through the gate. Then he raised the catch with a chubby hand and went out. He knew the road to Chiswell's perfectly, although he had never walked the distance, but with obstinate determination he made up his mind that he would walk it now. He would go to Lynn and Tom Tinker and find out for himself whether they wanted him or not. It was early evening and near his bedtime, and the brightness of the summer afternoon had clouded over, and there was a stormy feeling in the air. But Buster walked on, heedless of the threatening sky, rejoicing in his suddenly discovered independence. He was a man, able to look after himself, 
He would tell Dodie when he got back home of the wonderful thing he had done, and she would realize that he was indeed the man he was always being told to be by his father, and feel proud of him. He had gone nearly a mile when he saw a blue butterfly. It flitted before him for a few yards, then suddenly rose and flew over a hedge into a field. There was a gate close by, and Buster followed, and there, in the field, he saw half a dozen brown rabbits, who looked at him with bright, inquisitive eyes, before they turned tail and scuttled, scuttled away, their little white tails bobbing behind them invitingly. Away went Buster in hot pursuit, laughing and shouting gleefully, and one of the... And when one of the rabbits turned suddenly and dodged into a wood, he followed unhesitatingly, and it was as he went on stumbling through bracken and, through bracken and undergrowth, intent only on his object, that the first crash of thunder rent the sultry evening. Buster screamed and stood still. Like many children, he was terrified of thunder, and one panic-stricken glance around him told him that he was far from home, and in a place where he had never been before. Daddy! Daddy! He screamed shrilly for his mother, knowing full well that she could not hear him. He ran to and fro, stumbling and scratching his little legs against hidden roots and brambles in a vain desire to find a way out. Then a vivid flash of lightning came, followed rapidly by a louder clap of thunder. Daddy! Daddy! Buster was half frantic with terror. His beautiful eyes were wild, and the soft hair on his forehead damp with fright. Crash! Crash! It seemed to his panic-stricken imagination that the whole wood was lit with fire for a moment before the third ear-splitting peal stunned and deafened him. He turned wildly to escape it, caught his foot in a bramble that grew hidden. He turned wildly to escape to escape from it, cut his foot in a bramble that grew hidden amongst the bracken, and came heavily to the ground, striking his forehead against an old tree stump. And that is the end of chapter 18 of The Matherson Marriage by Ruby M. Ayers. Return, I hope that you return soon to hear the next chapter and find out what happened to Buster. Thank you for listening to this chapter with me, and I hope you have a great day. Bye!